And now, I now present one of the Sons of Vision Label, Son of Vision Label, Buffalo Bill Huff. Shabbat shalom, everyone. You may be seated, may the peace of Yah be with each and every one of you. My title today is, Who is a Thief and a Robber? Now a person who does not ask and comes in some other way is called a thief and a robber. If you don't turn in your books of Yahweh to Yachanan 10, and let's look at verse 1. Cruelly, cruelly, I say to you, he who does not enter through the door into the sheepfold but climbs in some other way, he is both a thief and a robber. Look down at verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. So Pope Francis, aborting babies, killing people, is stealing and you're a thief and a robber. And the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. In Nicomia 3, Verse 1, we see, and no, in the coming 3, verse 1, it says, Woe to the bloody city, it is full of lies and robbery, there is no end to its victims. Now that sounds like today, the robbery and the lies that the people tell, and the robbery of possessions, but just not possessions, killing people, stealing people's lives. And after a person commits a crime, if they even get caught, when mankind system what they throw them in jail, in, they're not learning in jail that it's wrong to do the crime. The only thing they think about in jail is, how more sneakier could I have been? But it never teaches them that doing the crime is wrong. Now, here's the crime clock of 2010 and it says one violent crime occurred every 21.7 seconds, one murder every 37 minutes, one rape every 6.6 .6 minutes, one robbery every 1.5 minutes, one aggravated assault every 43.5 seconds, one property crime occurred every 3.7 seconds, one burglary every 16.4 seconds, one warranty theft every 5.3 seconds, one motor vehicle theft every 45.1. In the first book of Yeshua, chapter 13, verse 43, it says, Turn over to Yeshua's writings for this word, sheepful. It is speaking of the house of Yahweh. Yachanan 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter through the door into the sheepfold, meaning the house of Yahweh, but climbs in some other way, he is both a thief and a robber. We see people like this today. Now, if you'd all turn to Malachi 3, Malachi 3, and let's look at verse 8. Will a man rob Yahweh? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings, you're cursed with a curse. Yes, this whole nation, for you have robbed me. If you turn to Yachanan, turn back to Yachanan 10, let's look at verse 2 this time. But he who enters through the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Look at verse 8. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. So I know G2 says, he means all the false prophets who led men away from the Yeshua and his body. So you thief, Pope Francis, you know it's wrong to steal, you know it's wrong to kill, but you won't repent. If you turn to Isaiah 59, 
And let's look at verse 6. Their webs will not serve as clothing, nor will they cover themselves with what they make. Their, their works are works of iniquity. The act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. They do not know the way of peace, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever walks on them will not know peace. But they won't stop doing this, this violence, because it's how they... And this, because it's how they rake in these billions of dollars in doing this. But the shepherd, Yeshua Hawkins, is calling. So come into the sheepfold, the house of Yahweh, and come into unity and learn what to teach, so you can teach what you learn. And now, I'll turn it over to the great Sunny Israel label, Nvidia for prayer. And now it's a privilege and honor to introduce to you son of Yezreel Abel, Deacon Yezreel David Hawkins. Shalom, everyone. Please be seated. If you've been keeping up with the news lately, you're going to see that there's no shortage of people dying. That's for sure. People being murdered. Just recently there was a, uh, um, a guy that had a... Uh, they said he had anger issues and needed counseling. But uh, he drove his family off of a bridge into the water, killed all of them. Uh, you'll see that you see the war in Syria taking place, fighting, you know, what they call ISIS, who is uh, spread, trying to spread their religion throughout the world. You have the U.S., uh, who is backed by the Pope, trying to spread democracy throughout the world, and uh, saying that Assad needs to be removed because, as we know, he's not following the Catholic Church and their religion. Um, the nations are killing each other, and the leaders, they don't have any answers either. The answers that they're giving are just causing more and more problems, and they're running in circles, kind of like saying, you know, we need to come to agreements. We need to talk and come to agreements, but we see no agreements, do we? So uh, you'd think being the leaders of the world, the people that are, you know, went to school to learn these things, they have the training, the education to learn the, to do these things, to solve these problems that they'd have answers, right? That they'd be able to come to these solutions, to these agreements. But they don't. They're only making the problems worse. So why is that? Why don't our leaders have answers? Why don't the people have answers? Why can't the world come to a kind of a, a great conclusion here? Well, President Obama put it really plainly a few weeks, uh, weeks ago when they had the Oregon school shooting. He said that we have sick minds. Sick minds. Our people's minds are confused. Now, well, why do we have sick minds? So let's find out. If you go to Yahweh'sBranch.com, Pastor puts out a news release every week. He puts out an article every single week. And uh, if you want that news article every week, by the way, if you subscribe to YPNNews.com, you'll get sent that news article every week. Just want to throw that in there. You really should be reading every one of these news articles that Pastor puts out. He said we should. So in a recent article, he showed that through sin, through sin we get the sickness of the mind. Through sin we get this confusion. If you'll turn over to Leviticus chapter 11, it's on page 89 of your book of Yahweh. Leviticus chapter 11. and verse 3, this is Yahweh speaking to Moshe and Aaron through the priests. It says, you may eat every animal that has a split hoof, completely divided, and which chews the cud. These you may eat. Nevertheless, there are some that only chew the cud, or only have a split hoof. You must not eat these. The camel, because it doesn't, have a, uh, it doesn't chew the cud, it, or excuse me, it chews the cud, but does not have a split hoof. It's unclean. Later down in verse 8, it says, their meat you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. Verse 10, it says, Everything that doesn't have fins and scales, you may not eat. They're an abomination. Verse 11 says, They will be an abomination to you. 
You must not eat their flesh. You shall regard them as an abomination. And then all th- later on in this chapter, it keeps saying how it's an abomination. An abomination. But what is an abomination? In Pastor's article, he says the word abomination in verses 10 through 13 translates to the English word sickness and disease. Sickness and disease. Scientists know that swine, which is an unclean food that it plainly says here we should not eat, but the Pope isn't telling people that, right? So the swine harbors parasites inside of its bodies that's common to them, but harmful to mankind. Once consumed, these parasites can bore through the stomach wall, enter the bloodstream, and spread to every organ of the body, including the brain. Now science knows this, including the brain. This knowledge was only recently discovered uh, in the 19th century, but Yahweh's inspired prophets wrote about this around 1490 BCE. So they're only finding this out recently, but if they had just followed the Bible, followed the Scriptures, what the Scriptures teach, they would have known this all along. So, uh, Yahweh says it's an abomination, meaning it's going to cause sickness and disease. It'll cause confusion. Later on in the article, Pastor explains Leviticus 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 and shows how all these activities that society is now condoning and saying, go ahead, be gay, just follow your heart, do whatever, are causing sicknesses and diseases, confusion of the mind. Okay, now you think that uh, since Yahweh, he created mankind, he created all of us, he knows how the bodies function, right? You would think so. Uh, Of course he does. Like uh, the scripture says, let Yahweh be true and all men a liar. Because, uh, you know, the things that we think we know, praise Yahweh, the the things that we think we know all prove to be false if it didn't come from Yahweh. Uh, Remember in Psalms 100, it said, It's He that made us and not we ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. Yahweh did. So we need to follow Yahweh. But uh, this is all in Yahweh's plan. Now, of course, Yahweh doesn't want people to die. He doesn't want uh, children to be murdered. I mean, you saw the pictures that are, that are taking place in the news, and you'll see more today. Of uh, You know, people are just being, being uh, brutally slaughtered. But this is all in Yahweh's plan. So is Yahweh like he, he hates people? No, of course not. And people say, you know, why, if Yahweh is so powerful, why doesn't he allow all this to be stopped? Why doesn't he just stop it? Doesn't allow these innocent babies to die, women and children to be dying? Well, why? Satan's way is that uh, you can get peace through war. You can get peace through force. Okay? And she's trying to prove her way too. Remember, she rebelled against Yahweh. And she wants to destroy mankind. But she's saying, you know, I can bring peace. Trust me, I can bring peace. So Yahweh's saying, go ahead and prove your way. Go ahead and prove your way to the heavens and prove your way to the people that you can bring peace. If Yahweh was to step in and stop this, well, what could, he could have an excuse, right? Well, you stepped in. I could have brought peace, but you stepped in. So no, all these people that are dying, when they're resurrected, are you, think, you think they're going to want sin's way? You think they're going to want Satan's way? <laughs> heavens, no, they're not going to want Satan's way because they died brutally as a result of Satan's way. So, we need to learn as much as we can about Yahweh's plan, about what causes these sicknesses and diseases, what causes this confusion of the mind. We need to learn as much as we can. That way, when these people are resurrected, we can be their saviors. We can teach them exactly what they need to know, because they're going to hate sin as it is. But we need to teach them that way they won't be causing sin and sickness and disease to anybody else. Praise Yahweh. So you you really need to read these articles the pastor puts out. Please read the newsletters, the prophetic words, that's uh, and the sermons. That's uh, you know the uh, material that you're going to need to teach this, to teach these people, to teach uh, all these people that are definitely going to hate sin when they get resurrected. But we are the saviors to this world. So learn, learn as much as you can. If you'll all please stand. I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker, the great Kahan Benjamin Krause Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, saints of Yahweh. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. It's a great honor and privilege to speak before Yahweh's called out ones, the children of light in these last days. The true children of light. There's some imposters out there that are claiming to be of the light. 
And uh, we're going to be talking about that. Now, I hope everyone has their pen and paper, their inkhorn, and their uh, parchment, or paper, or whatever you're using nowadays. Um, I'm going to, let me just tell you right now, you're not going to get the whole plate today, okay? So, I'm not going to dump a lot of things on you all at once, but I do want you to know that uh, it is some very amazing things that Yahweh is bringing to light in these last days. And after all, as I said, as I showed you before, this is the year of light in uh, their thinking, right? But it's also that way in Yahweh's thinking. Now, what I aim to show you, and I want you to write this down, we're going to be talking about the numbers 40 and 39. And I'm going to show you, what I'm going to show you is, we well, are in a transformation. Not only the house of Yahweh is transforming, and you'll learn more about that, but there's also another race, Satan. Satan's race. Remember, there's two races, side by side, neck and neck. And they are also transforming. And we're going into another period. Okay, and that's what I want you to understand about the numbers 39 and 40. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to lay it out, hopefully in such a way that everyone here, the smallest child, can understand what, what is taking place in, in this year 2015. And now we're in the year 2016, Yahweh's way. So are you ready? Yeah. Okay, now some of these things will be a little familiar for you, but uh, we're going to go through them. And we're going to start with the definition for 2015. Because even though we just passed, in, in Yahweh's way, we passed that year, the things that I'll be covering are very pertinent. And now, I want you to notice, first of all there, that number 512. Does, any, does that ring a bell to you? That is the only number, this is what's called a prime root, or primitive root. Primitive root means it doesn't go to any other word. It's the only one. And notice the only number associated with it. From the theological word book of the Old Testament, it's number 512. Does that ring a bell, pastor's dream? That Yahweh is in full control of this situation. Everybody knows that, right? Does everyone believe that? Now I want you to notice, we're talking about this transformation that's taking place. Notice the definition of this word, 2015. It means to change, to transform, be perverse, that means upside down or backwards or not the right way, be changed, be overthrown, to transform oneself. Pay attention. Remember both races that I'm talking about here. To transform yourself or oneself. And to be converted. Now I want you to remember Acts chapter 3 verse 19. We should all know that by heart, right? Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. You all remember that, right? And also remember how that's done in Psalm 19, verse 7. Remember, the law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the whole person, okay? So that's the uh, Hebrew definition of 2015. Now let me give you the Greek definition. It's the word epiphany, and it means appearing, Manifestation. And these words should bring a hundred different scriptures to your mind right now. Okay? And I'll, I'll remind you of some of them. Do you remember there's two races taking place and there's also two manifestations that are taking place. One of them is the manifestation of the sons of Yahweh spoken of in Romans chapter 8. Okay? And I believe that's verse 28 for your notes that the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of Yahweh, the appearance to make known, okay? But then, 
Remember 1 Yachanon 3, 7, verse 8 says that, let's turn over there real quick. 1 Yachanon 3, 7, this is quoted quite a bit um, in all the pastor's newsletters. It's on page 955 or 965, um, and it says, Little children, that's you and me, let no man, Pope, Guru, uh, Ellen White, Seventh-day Adventist uh, creator, uh, you know, anyone deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Yahweh was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And he goes on to talk in verse 10 about, in this, the children of Yahweh, now, Let's read verse 9. Whoever is begotten of Yahweh does not commit sin. They don't practice sin. For his seed remains in him. They don't go out of the sheepfold. Okay? They remain in the sheepfold. They remain in him by practicing what he teaches them in the house of Yahweh. They remain in him. And it is possible for them not to sin because he's been begotten of Yahweh. Verse 10, in this, the children of Yahweh and the children of the devil are manifested. That means that's how you're going to know them. And uh, if you remember uh, Matithi chapter 15 or 7 where it, and 15 where it talks about those two trees. You know that a tree of righteousness cannot bring forth sin. So it's not possible for Pastor Israel Hawkins in the house of Yahweh to bring forth sin in any way to you. Okay, it's not possible. But at the, on the other hand, it's not possible for Pope Francis or any of the daughters of the whore or daughters of Jorge to be able to teach you righteousness in any form. So if you're looking outside the house of Yahweh for any help, so to speak, you're looking in the wrong direction. Okay, your help, my help, our help is in Yahweh and nowhere else. Okay. Now, this definition also means to show forth and appear a fitting manifestation or what the world calls an epiphany. You know, the Feast of Epiphany is with the appearance of the Christ child, they call it, or the appearance of the Messiah, as we know him. Now, it's from word number 2016, which has this, basically the same meaning, but it means to manifest glorious, illustrious, become visible, especially in a splendid, transforming way. Everybody getting this, I want you to, 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 to remember these words, transformation, transforming, okay? And it's from 2014, and it means to appear, to shine upon. And it means to appear to achieve the fitting purpose. And it's from this word here, phaino. That's word number 5316. And that means to bring to light, to cause to appear. Those are the definitions of 2015. Now, I want you to remember, keep in mind that the Hebrew calendar... 2015 to 2016, um, it's the Jewish, the, what they call it's the Hebrew year 5776 on the calendar. Um, and it begins September 14, 2015, and ends October 2nd, 2016. Okay? That's the Hebrew calendar. It's Hebrew year 5776. And that's 76 is extremely important to you. Okay, we're talking about the mark of the beast. We're going to be talking about the spirit of 76. We're going to be talking about the bicentennial uh, in the writing and the, 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 pre, the publishing and the, or the, the writing and the publishing of the mark of the beast and why this was so significant in history. Now, and uh, let's see, let me go on to this. And if you remember also, this was proclaimed the International Year of Light by the United Nations, okay? And there's some other reasons why 
They're putting forth this year of light. And I'm going to remind you of some of those things as we go along. But like I said, it's going to be piece by piece. We're going to put this together, okay? And we're going to do it in such a way where we don't... I'm going to try not to confuse anyone. I don't want to do that. We're going to be talking about the number 40. And, uh, you know... uh, Pastor mentions that 40 quite frequently. You know, he'll remind us 40 years in the wilderness I've been preaching, you know, and uh, some of those things. But I'll remind you of some of the other things in Scripture about the number 40. But before we get into that, I thought this was interesting. Since we're talking about the mark of the beast. On CNN yesterday, they're, they're proclaiming that this monster hurricane is about to hit Mexico. And it hit last night. It made landfall at about 5.30 in the afternoon on the west coast. So it'd be a cyclone because it's in the western or in the western uh, part and it rotates a different direction. And uh, you can read about that in the Peaceful Solution too. And the responsibility unit, it talks about cyclones and hurricanes and the difference. But it called it a monster. And not only that, it said it's the strongest hurricane in history. Okay, this remember what Yahshua said about these things that are going to be taking place, that they're going to grow worse and worse. Okay, that wasn't the only one that called it a monster. CNN called it a monster, but Drudge, the Drudge report said Mexico monster. Now, remember the work we did on monster, remember the the monster energy and the, the three was the 666. Okay, these are all important. I want you to keep those things in your mind because they tie into the mark of the beast and what we're going to be learning about this mark. And you know, you're always giving us signs. We're seeing these signs everywhere. I want to remind you of a picture I showed last time. Okay, now, you remember this lady here? (laughs) Out there, uh, Hurricane Joaquin. Okay? Since we're talking about 40... I thought that this would be interesting to you. There's a cargo ship. It's called the El Faro. The Pharaoh. Remember? Remember the Pharaoh, the horse? It disappeared. It was 40 years old and it disappeared in what they call the Bermuda Triangle. Anybody heard of that before? It was on a journey from Jacksonville, Florida to Puerto Rico. Okay? Pretty simple... uh, Simple deal, right? Well, you would think. This ship was built in Pennsylvania. You're going to hear a lot about Pennsylvania and Philadelphia as well as we go along. But it's a 40-year-old ship. Now, I want you to know there was 33 people on that ship. 33 people disappeared. There's another one here says, search continues for Jacksonville cargo ship lost in hurricane. And there were 33 men, 33 on the crew. 28 were Americans, 5 were Polish people. And it tells you that that word El Faro is Spanish for the lighthouse. The lighthouse. Can you write that down? El Faro, the lighthouse. It's a 735-foot cargo ship that was caught in Hurricane Joaquin, traveling in the Bermuda Triangle, as they call it. In fact, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like right here. Everybody see that? There would be Jacksonville, and here would be Puerto Rico where they were going, and that's called the Bermuda Triangle. And if you remember in the 70s, particularly around the time Pastor wrote The Mark of the Beast, the Bermuda Triangle was, they wrote books and made movies and, and everything about that. The Bermuda, how the ships and planes would go in this area and they would disappear. And they had all these theories about dimensions, you know, dimensional doors, you know, and somehow they disappeared. In fact, back then there was another movie that was, or another book that was very enlightening. It was called The Philadelphia Experiment. And it was uh, talked about how they made a ship disappear. Right. The the Navy did experiments where they made they use these radar or something and made this ship actually not be able to be seen. And I'm sure there's some elements of truth to it, but they didn't go through no dimensional doors, I guarantee. Okay, now, so they're searching for the El Faro in the Bermuda Triangle. They still haven't found it. 
33 missing. Now, I want to show you, um, let me get my notes together here. So it's a 40-year-old ship. Now, we're going to be talking about the numbers 40 and 39. We'll get to the 39 as well, but I want you to notice something that this woman said about losing her loved one. This lady lost one of her family members, was one of the crew members. She said, this is torture. This is torture. Y'all remember that word coming up? Torture and the testing and the trial that are coming upon the world at this time? Y'all remember that? Okay, we're, we'll go over that more in detail later. She said, I'm just praying to God. She said, I'm just praying to God that they find the ship and bring my daughter and everyone home on it. It says, this maritime mystery bears a striking similarity to another incident more than 30 years ago. In 1983, a 39-year-old cargo ship called the SS Marine Electric sank off the coast of Virginia. Okay? So they mentioned the numbers 40 and 39. That's interesting, right? Because that's what we're going to be learning about. Here's when the ship was built. 1975. Okay? You can write that number down. You're going to be hearing a lot about that as we go along and we go through this. Now that El Faro, this is, you can go on Google here and just type in Faro, and here's the etymology of it. Everybody see that? You see the word Faro? That's how they used to, that's how they used to uh, spell it. F-A-R-O. It says, early 18th century, originally as Faro or Faro, from French Faron, and said to have been the name of the king of hearts. Okay, now, this is interesting. Remember I told you there was 33 people on board? In the triangle, the Bermuda Triangle. Do you all remember this picture being shown at the feast? Everybody remembers that, right? Order out of chaos. Order out of chaos. With the 33 in the triangle. In the El Faro, the lighthouse. Okay? Do you see what's taking place? Well, you will. As we go along, you'll see a lot more. Now, that's interesting about that is this is a Masonic uh, Pharisee, Sadducee, Essene, and Herodian sign. And notice this. This is the lighthouse of Alexandria, Egypt. And it's called the Pharos of Alexandria. Okay, now remember Alexandria, Egypt, Pastor wrote about being the cradle of Christianity, okay? And its location, as is shown here, is the Pharos, Alexandria, Egypt, okay? And it used to be one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, okay? You all remember? Uh, in fact, it shows here the Great Pyramid of Giza was also on that list of seven, the seven ancient wonders of the world, along with this lighthouse right here called the Pharos. It shows here that Pharos became the etymological origin of the word lighthouse in Greek, okay, and then and also in Spanish. Now what's interesting in that, about that, because remember where all this came from out of Egypt, all this religion of the Coptic Catholics, that came out of Egypt, that are now called Catholics. The George, George Washington Masonic National Memorial is the, the biggest Masonic memorial in America. And notice, it's a Masonic building located in Alexandria, Virginia. Okay? And it's the first, it's named after the first president of the United States and a Mason. The tower is fashioned after the ancient lighthouse of Alexandria, Egypt. Oh, so you mean the Masons are in control of the news too? You mean, you mean, you think? You think they're not showing us something in the news? 
You, you ain't been paying attention to the news if you haven't been seeing these signs everywhere on the news. Okay? But you're going to learn how to see these signs. You're going to learn what they're up to. You're going to learn about the transformation that is taking place at this time. Okay? Not only in the house of Yahweh, but in Satan's realm, which is anywhere outside the gate of the house of Yahweh. Okay? Or, you know, the, 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 the land of Yahweh over on T&P Lane. <laughs> okay? Anything that's, that's, that's owned or dedicated to the house of Yahweh, anything outside of that is Satan's realm. Now, let's get into this 40-day. Now, Pastor wrote, I want you to write this down, Pastor wrote The Mark of the Beast in 1975. Okay? And I remember some of the stories that some of the great Gohans that used to hang out with Pastor, man, what a blessing that must have been. <laughs> Might have been scary, too, in some ways, because, man, if you were doing things you didn't quite know you were supposed to be doing, Pastor would probably be, you know, lovingly pointing those things out to you too, right? But uh, it would be a joy to be able to hang out with Pastor like that. But I remember even some of the Kohans talking, it might have been the great Kohan Yadidia, where he talked about Pastor writing even as he was sleeping. That pen, that pencil would still be moving. You all remember those stories? In fact, they wrote a song about that. Pencil riding through the night. Remember that one? Okay, so um, the 40 day, let's talk about the 40 days and nights. It's been 40 years, and 2015 was 40 years from the date Pastor wrote The Mark of the Beast. And I'm going to show you some things here in a minute to, 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 to get us on that vein. But let's talk about some of the things that took place over 40 day periods and why the number 40 represents, I want you to write this down, trial, trial. Testing, proving, probation, and major transformations that took place after the period of 40 years, okay, or 40 days even, which we'll see here in a minute. But the number 40, that's what it represents. And I want to read some of the, just remind you some of the scriptures. You can go back over these yourself because there's so many of them. But remember, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights when Yahweh wanted to cleanse the world. Okay. Noah waited, and that's about Genesis 7, 12 for your notes. And at Genesis 8, 6, it said Noah waited for 40 days after it rained before he opened a window in the ark. Uh, embalming in Egypt, that was a custom in Egypt. Remember, they embalmed Yosef in Egypt. It took 40 days. Moshe was on the mountain with Yahweh for 40 days and 40 nights twice in his life. Twice, two times. Moshe's face shone. And this is uh, Exodus 34, 29 for your notes. By the way, Moshe being on the mountain for 40 days twice, you can write down Exodus 24, 18, Exodus 34, 28, 29, and Deuteronomy 10, 10, where he says, Now I stayed on the mountain 40 days and nights as I did the first time, and Yahweh listened to me at this time also. It was not his will to destroy you. Exodus 34, 29 says that Moshe's face shone after the 40 days on the mountain. His face shone. It shined. It took the spies 40 days to search out the promised land and bring back fruit from the promised land. That's in uh, Numbers 13, 25. The Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness one year for each, for each day they explored the land. Remember uh, the ten spies that came back with a bad report, but then the two that gave the righteous report, and they murmured and they grumbled and complained, and so they were given the 40, the 40 years, a year for each day, the spies went out to search out the land. You can find that in Exodus 16.35 and Numbers 14, 33, and 34. And like I said, we can't go to all these. We'd be, it'd take too long. But I'm just going to give you some examples of this 40 day. Um, Yana warned the city of Nineveh that they had 40 days until it would be overthrown. 
And you remember that word overthrown was in that definition of 2015. Overthrow. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah that also took place. And that's in Yana 3 verse 4. And um, of course the people turned from their evil way and the, the things didn't come down upon them at that time. It did later. Yahshua, everybody should be familiar with Yahshua Messiah, fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. That's in Matitia 3.17, uh, Matitia 4, 1 and 2. And it showed in Matitia 4, 1 and 2 that Yahshua was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness and um, he was tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry, it says. Yahshua was seen after his resurrection, and you can find this in uh, Acts 1-3. He was on the earth for 40 days, teaching about things that pertain to the kingdom of Yahweh. If you remember Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that it says that after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of Yahweh. Now, I want you to also remember, in Moshe's lifetime, okay, there, he was 120 years old when he died, okay? But in his lifetime, there were three 40-year periods that he went through. And I'll just briefly cover those. If you remember, the first period of 40 years, he was born of a Hebrew slave, okay, a woman, a Hebrew slave, but he was taken into the Pharaoh's house by Pharaoh's daughter. Remember how he was put in a basket in the reeds along the river and he was pulled out by the Pharaoh's daughter. And then such Yahweh is so fully in control of things that Moshe's own mother was able to raise him and take care of him. Isn't that awesome? Or awesome? You know, I mean, when you read these, when you read these things, you should just like be marveling at how in full control Yahweh actually is. And uh, that's in Exodus 2, 1 through 10 for your notes. So he was 40 years in Pharaoh's palace. You know, what was he doing there? You know, what did he do for those 40 years? Well, he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And I'm trying to remember where that was. It's in the book of Acts. It, book of Acts chapter 7 talks about that. Let's turn over there. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, and um, we're going to look at uh, verse 22. And this, if you remember, this is the oration that the great deacon Stephen gave before uh, the council, before they stoned him. Um, but uh, in, he was given a kind of a, a summary of, you know, book 1. And it says in verse 2, or verse 20, it says, at that time Moshe was born and was well-pleasing to Yahweh, and he was brought up in his father's house for three moons. And when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him as her own son. And Moshe was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And then it shows that when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers the children of Israel, okay? When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And that is when Moshe, during that second 40-year period, went to the desert in Midian to the house of Yahweh and learned under the great priest Yethro. Everybody remembers pastor sermons about this, right? Okay, so during that 40 years, now remember, he ran from Egypt. Remember, he killed the Egyptian. So did, did, did Moshe know the peaceful solution at that time? No, he did not. He had to go and learn, okay? He had to go into the wilderness and be taught by the priest of Yahweh, okay? Because he had that mixture. Remember, he was brought up in Egypt, okay? He was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and then, of course, the last 40 years, he became the deliverer of Israel. Remember, he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. He wasn't time back 
when he was 40 years old. Even though, you know, if you read the scriptures, he, he kind of thought in his mind, don't these people know who I am? You know? And he saw his brothers being mistreated, but it wasn't time yet. He had to go and he had to learn more, okay? But he took all the learning that he had with him, that he took, that he took from Egypt, because it, it benefited him in a lot of ways. Now, I want, you to remind, I want to remind you of Pastor Israel Hawkins. The first 40 years of pastor's life. Pastor was born in 1934, right? Now, here's some of the jobs that pastor had. <laughs> this is kind of cool. I like this. And you can add to it, I'm sure, because I don't have all of them. He was a plowboy and a farmer, okay? And everything that goes with that, okay? During that first 40 years. He sold Hertel Blue Ribbon Bibles, so he was the Bible sales guy. He worked for the Kansas State Board of Health Laboratory. Okay, now remember, that's an Egyptian place, right? <laughs> okay. And, of course, he knew some, the laws of Yahweh, and he knew the things they were doing wrong, but, you know, he's in Egypt, right? And they're going to do what they want to do. But he warned them about these things while he was working there. He was also a rockabilly singer. I think his group is called the Whippoorwills, okay? And uh, he looked pretty cool, didn't he? <laughs> Rockabilly, I think, is the cross between rock and hillbilly music or something, I guess. I don't know. I'm guessing. Maybe Pastor can shed light on that since it's the year of light. He was also a bull rider. <laughs> he was a fisherman. In fact, he told us stories about how he used to fight sharks down there in Corpus Christi and other places with the great Kahanya Didia, okay? In fact, he told me he was down there uh, teaching uh, the peaceful solution way before I got there. He said, I used to, I used to take uh, the Creator Has a Name flyers, and he said he would put a quarter in the newspaper machine, and he'd stuff all the newspapers with flyers, okay? But notice, he paid to open the machine, you know? He didn't bust into it and start sticking stuff in there and think, well, 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 Yahweh understands, you know. I'm just trying to get the message out. You know, he didn't do stuff like that. He was also the second miller at Kimball's Flour Mill. Okay, so he was a miller. Not, not to be confused with the other stuff you drink. He was a used car salesman. In fact, I think he still is. He was a dog breeder. And he knew all about breeding, okay? Breeding not just dogs, but cows and other, other things. He was a real estate guy, okay? He still is. He had 107 rent houses in Abilene, and he did all the maintenance on those rent houses. In fact, I remember a great uh, Kohana over here telling us how she first met Pastor under her sink, and that was the first time she heard about Yahweh, Pastor Israel Hawkins, out of his mouth. Can you imagine the blessing that would be to hear that? You know, the first time that you hear Yahweh and, and he's under your sink fixing your pipes. I could just imagine that, you know. Uh, he was a gas station attendant, okay? Who knows, maybe he worked at a 76 station, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but his last job that he had in the world before he came, before he went full time into Yahweh's work, was of all things an Abilene police officer. Okay? And uh, we're going to get into that part here. Now, remember the things I told you about 40. Now, the first 40 years of pastor's life, okay, you can see how it, how it reflects Moshe's first 40 years. Okay? But now, something took place after that. Let's see if I can put this here. Because I don't want to get off. Um, a transformation was starting to, to develop at that time. Now, I'm taking this from... This is uh, chapter 20. This is the, uh, the seventh book of Israel. Teachers of Righteousness. And it's from 2007, and it's chapter 21, and it's part one of the seventh book, okay? Now, this sermon was dated, now write this down, this is very important. It was dated 6907. 6907. Well, why is that so important? What, what, what's the big deal about that? 
Well, first of all, it was exactly 40 years from the date of the Six-Day War in Israel in 1967. In fact, I'm going to show you here, and we're going to get into this because you've got to understand about this and how Yahweh, how Yahweh brought Pastor here at that time for a reason. Now here's information about the Six-Day War in Israel. The Six-Day War was also known as the June War of 1967. It was the Arab-Israeli War or the Third Arab-Israeli War. It was fought between the dates June 5th and 10th, 1967 by Israel and the neighboring states of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. So during that June 5th to June 10th. Now notice, this sermon is given on 6907. This is exactly 40 years to the day. You see how precise Yahweh is, right? Now, I want to show you, by the way, write this down also. It was exactly seven years before the sash vision on 6 8 14. Remember the rainbow sash? Okay, that was on 6 8 14. So it was exactly seven years before the rainbow sash. But let's think about the 40 right now. Now I'm going to read you some excerpts here um, about pastors, uh, his early life here. Here's what he says in verse 29. But it was 40 years ago on this month, this month, he says, I went on the police department on June 27th. That is, I started the academy in that month, June 27th. But he said, I moved but then I had moved to Abilene a few days before that. Okay, so it wasn't on June 27th that he came to Abilene. It was, he said, a few days or a few weeks. I can't remember. It's not coming to me. But I know it was in June and it was 40 years ago. June, 40 years ago. Okay, now this is in 2007. We're going to keep working off this sermon because this sermon was very significant. That, and I'm going to show you how this was in fulfillment of Bible prophecy that pastor came to Abilene in 1967. Now, in my remaining few moments, there's a prophecy in Yeketzkia. If everybody would turn to Yeketzkia chapter 4. In this uh, uh, Yeketzkia chapter 4, I'll give you a... A page number here in just a moment. You can't skip four, and it's on page um, uh, 628. Okay, now, and it he talks about this clay tile. You probably all remember this. But it says in verse 1, he says, Son of man, take a clay tile, lay it in front of you, and engrave on it the city Jerusalem. Lay siege to it, build a siege wall against it, heap a ramp against it, set army camps against it, and place battering rams against it on all sides. And then in verse 4 he says, Now lie down on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of the days that you will lie upon it, you will bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days so you will bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have completed them, you will lie down a second time on your right side. Then you will bear the iniquity of the house of Yada for 40 days. I have appointed you each day for a year. Okay, day for a year. So a total of 430 years is spoken of there. Now, some scholars did some math. And I'm going to show this to you. Because they couldn't figure out, like, okay, why 430 years? And it didn't make sense because this is way back in, you know, 600 and something B.C., you know, that Jerusalem was laid siege to, okay, by Babylon. But here's, here's an amazing formula. The 390 days, of course, the 40 years, judgment against the nation of Israel, 
It says in 606 BC, Israel was taken in, or Yada was taken into captivity by Babylon for exactly 70 years. So 430 minus 70 is 360 remaining in that judgment against the nation of Israel. But they couldn't figure, well, where's the rest of the 360 years? So they came up with this formula. They said, well, what about the seven factor, the seven times factor in Leviticus 2618, where Yahweh says, after this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So they did the math and they said, well, that would be 360 times seven, which is 2,520 years of judgment remaining against Israel. Okay? Now, the scripture, it says, uses 360 day years for prophecies and it expects us to add the appropriate leap months on schedule. So what they did was, they said the easiest way to unravel this is to first convert this prophecy into days. So they took the 25, 20 years and they times it by 360 and they got 907,200 days of judgment remaining against the nation of Israel after the Babylonian captivity. Now they needed to convert those 907,200 days into our 365.25 day Julian calendar that the world goes by at this time. So they added the .25 adjusting for the leap years. So 365.25. So here's what they came up with. Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity in 606 B.C. for 70 years to 536 B.C.E. So that was the end of the first 70 years of judgment. And then they added the 2,483 years from the Julian calendar conversion. And they added one year because zero is not a year. Zero AD is not a year. So they added the year. And it came to 1948. Does anybody remember what occurred in 1948? Well, it was the creation of what they call Israel. The nation of Israel, okay? Now... On May 14, 1948, is when Harry Truman recognized that nation and it was declared to be a nation on May 14, 1948. Now, don't get that confused now because that is not the Israel that Yahweh was talking about. And I'm going to prove it to you. Okay? Now, here's something very amazing that this is noted by the scholars. They said, now shift the exact same prophetic timeline to start on the year when Babylon returned and destroyed Jerusalem 19 years later. Okay, they came back 19 years later and destroyed Jerusalem. And remarkably, this prophetic timeline's end point now falls on the exact year Israel once took again sovereign control of Jerusalem in 1967 after the Six-Day War. Okay, so now let me show you something. The Siege of Jerusalem, 589 B.C., it says, Nebuchadnezzar II laid siege to Jerusalem, culminating in the destruction of the city and its temple in the summer of 587 B.C. So write down 587 B.C. Okay, now, I just did something I shouldn't have done. So 1967, they said that's amazing because that's when Jerusalem was taken, or Jerusalem was captured in the Six-Day War in that week, in that June 5th. In fact, it was 6 7 67 that they captured Jerusalem. But guess what? That is not the Israel that Yahweh was speaking of. Okay? That is not where the gathering was going to take place. Now, remember what they said about add 19 years and go from the date of the siege of or when Jerusalem was actually destroyed in 587. When you do that same math and you add the 19 years, you'll get 1967. Now, man, I got to get this in. My pastor told me I could go over a little if I had to. I got to get this in to lay this foundation here. Pastor goes on to say in that same sermon from 6907, 
Okay, this is from 12th book of Israel, part 2. Pastors, uh, it's chapter 15, verse 22. And it was during the sermon that I gave on the number 19. He mentions here that he wanted to know if I had brought anything out about that number 40 because he said it's a great, there's a great significance for this number 19 that he was bringing out in connection with the number 40, okay? He asked if I had said anything about the number 40, but the number 40, he said, had great significance to this number 19, okay? Everybody getting that? And remember, 1948 plus 19 is what year? 1967. I can't go away without reading this part to you right now. Okay, now this is from the second book of Israel. Chapter 4, verse 55 and verse 9. He says, you are a chosen generation. That is, if you will do these things and overcome, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now this word nation should be gathering. You everybody got it? The word nation should be gathering. When Yahweh says, I'm going to make you a holy nation, it has nothing to do with a nation like we know of as a nation today or the United Nations, or the nation of Israel. You getting it? Has nothing to do with that. Or anything like that. It's a gathering that Yahweh is gathering out of the people. It means those who He calls out. Okay? This is from the seventh book of Israel. Part 1, chapter 6, verse 27. Pastor says, well, of course, they got it in their minds that this is going to take place in Israel. See? But if you remember what the Savior said, all the things He said, Yahweh will not be worshipped there. Remember? Yachanan 4, for your notes. Remember the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and He told her, Yahweh will not be worshipped in Yada or the mountains of Samaria. Okay, he's leaving that place. They rejected him, okay? And he showed in the top nation of all nations is where it would be established. He says, but if you remember what the Savior said, he said, Yahweh will not be worshipped there, remember? He says, he won't be worshipped there, not in the mountains of Galilee, nor in Jerusalem will he be worshipped. But he knew of these prophecies, of course, that said, in the last days, I will establish my house in the top nation of all nations. Do you believe that? This is the sixth book of Israel, chapter 29, verse 46. Notice, build up the house. Get your minds on building the house. Not fearing, you know. You're liable to go to Israel if you fear. <laughs> all right? And he says, he says, uh, like somebody was wanting to here a while back, they were wondering, should we not all move to Israel? I tell you, that's the frying pan and the fire in Israel, and it's going to be unprotected to a certain extent. The ones that turn to Yahweh are the ones that's left in Israel right at the end when this takes place, brethren. There's going to be very few people left in Israel. Okay? In fact, so few that a child could write them down. It's going to be burned up. It's not protected to a certain extent. There's going to be very few people left at that time, but of course, some will turn to Yahweh like the quartet because they're an essential part of it because they're being guided by it. Okay? Now, remember his brother went to Israel in 1967. And he talks about uh, his brother talking, wanting to him to go to Israel. And he said, no. He said, it's not time for us to go there. And he started to understand the prophecies regarding this gathering. But here's what he says in the fifth book of Israel, chapter 31, verse 79. It says, Jacob established the house of Yahweh according to his own writings. He established it in Israel by prayer and fasting only. But he could not preach to that state, so he moved back to America. Remember, he spent seven years from 67 to 74. 
He sent it to the U.S. first by the prophetic watchman. He was sending this from Israel by a work that he and I both financed. I think I financed it because I had to buy him groceries all the time he was in Israel. (laughs) We financed it. Yahweh financed it through the blessings that came from a business in Abilene. It was called the prophetic watchman. That's exactly what took place there. Then he moved back to America from Nazareth, Israel, to Texas, where he and I established the house of Yahweh in a mobile home west of Abilene. I just got through telling you that. Now, before I go, I'm going to give you one one, uh, more definition. I already went over. A nice try. I don't want to go too far over, man. Okay, here. 1967. Remember the Six-Day War, right? Here's... The Hebrew term for 1967 from Strong's, and it means exterminating. It's from 1950. And it means confusion, as in war. War means confusion. And it's from 2000. And it means to move noisily, confuse, make a noise, consume, crush, destroy, trouble, vex. Move noisily, confuse, and it's from 1949 to 1993. Means to make an uproar, agitate greatly, destroy, uh, make noise, to show disquietude. You know, all talking about war, and it's from 1993. And it means to rage, to war, to clamor, and clamorous. Like the 67 war. You think Yahweh had anything to do with that war? Is Yahweh teaching war? Now watch this. Here's the other side of 1967. Here's the Greek, 1967. It's that word there. I don't even want to try it. (laughs) It means for the coming day for subsistence. That word subsistence means the action or fact of supporting oneself at a minimum level. Maintenance, keep up, upkeep, livelihood, room and board, nourishment, food. Like your subsistence is what you need to live on to get a job done, to get the work done. It means for the morrow, necessary, sufficient, and it's from 1909, appropriate to what is coming, suitable, apt for the coming day. Now I believe... uh, I think it's in this sermon, but uh, I'll show you here in a minute. Pastor said, he said, Yahweh, I just want you to give me a job that's suitable, that's suitable for the work. Okay? I need a suitable job for the work. And that's when he got into the the, uh, rent house business in 1967 when he joined the police department. And that's where he started to get the subsistence that he talked about that he was sending to uh, Jacob over in Israel to take care of him as well. Okay? Now, watch this. This is from this chapter 16. This is from the sermon dated 6.4.14. Notice here, I'm going to close with this. This is verse 60, 56. This is from the sermon about Jack Van Impey he gave just a few months ago. He says, when he brought me here to Abilene, Jack, in 1967, I was working for one thing. I had one thing in my mind, and I asked Yahweh to provide it, so that was to give me a suitable business. Suitable. Suitable, remember? Suitable for the day coming. Suitable for the work that he was going to do. And... uh, in closing here, just to show you this, uh, it's from this word right here, 3776, and it means property, wealth. Did he not have property? Property, wealth, substance. Property, estate, as in real estate, right? Suitable for the work that he was going to be doing over the next 40 years. And that's what we're going to get into next time I come up here. I better get off now. Or there may not be a next time. (laughs) But uh, now keep these things in your mind 
Israel is not the gathering place. You are at Israel right now. I'll talk more about that next time. This is the gathering place at Abilene. Okay, Abilene. This is the gathering place that Yahweh was speaking of. When you go from the destruction of Jerusalem and you add those years, it comes to 1967. Abilene, Texas was the place that Yahweh was speaking about for His gathering to be established in these last days. So we've got to get it out of our mind that Israel, the nation of Israel, that Yahweh was talking about a nation as we know it today. He was talking about a gathering, a nation. And we're going to get back on this 40 years the transformation that's taking place at this time in the number 39 and the mark of the beast. Oh, by the way, I cannot forget, in the mark of the beast, volume 2, the very last chapter, why was the house of Yahweh established? And he talks all about the gathering at Abilene. Okay, in the mark of the beast, volume 2. Get it and read it. Get volume one and two and get ready for the next time because I'm going to tell you, you are going to be in such great joy and surprise at what Yahweh's got in store at this time. May Yahweh bless your understanding. I'd like to turn it over now to one of Yahweh's great priests, the great Gahan, Ilya Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may all be seated. Now, in the news today, of course, there's so many things going on in our world today, it's becoming hard to keep up with all the prophecies that are taking place. And, of course, we're going to start out with the hurricane that is coming up through Mexico that the great Con Benjamin just mentioned. That's the strongest one. Remember, this would be the worst time ever. And here we're seeing things at their top levels, the highest magnitude. And we're talking about things of destruction. And of course, the violence continuing on and over the Temple Mount. Now, there's some very interesting uh, situations taking place, a lot of propaganda taking place, a lot of testing the mental waters to see how people are going to react. Um, there was a resolution that was drawn up this week. It was submitted, or Palestine wanted to submit it to UNESCO. Remember, UNESCO is United Nation. Uh, educational, scientific, and cultural organization. Now, they're based in France, and they are part of the United Nations. Well, but Palestine is not a member, so they had to get someone to present this resolution for them. Well, there were six Arab nations that did so, and it was Algeria, Egypt, Kuwait, Morocco, Tanzania, and the United Arab Emirates. All of them, on behalf of Palestine, submitted this resolution. Now, what they did was... They said that the al Aska Mosque, remember the tensions that have come up, the rules for the al Aska Mosque is that Jews may visit, but they are not allowed to pray. So they may visit the mosque, but they cannot pray in the mosque. Well, being that the Western Wall is connected as part to the al Aska Mosque, the Palestinians requested that the Western Wall be recognized as part of the al Aska Mosque. Therefore, Jews would not be allowed to pray at the Western Wall anymore. Now, of course, this generated a lot of tension. It was removed from the language of the resolution at the very last minute. But don't think that it wasn't done on purpose. It was put there to test the waters to see what would take place. And, of course, this morning, I want to read to you this morning, John Kerry was in Jordan this morning. Remember, they are the caretakers of this area. And it says that United States, Secretary, or United States Secretary of State said on Saturday, which was today, Israel had promised to maintain the traditional that Muslims are allowed to pray at the holy site in Jerusalem, Muslims only, an issue at the center of recent violence. Israel will continue to enforce its long-standing policies on religious worship at the Temple Mount, including the fundamental fact that it is Muslims who pray on the Temple Mount, that's the al Aska Mosque we're speaking of, and non-Muslims who visit, speaking of the Jewish and the Christian and so forth, but they're mainly speaking of the Jews here that went in. Remember, they threw the, they threw the things out of the mosque. There were people there that kind of secluded themselves and locked themselves in the mosque. Well, that's what they're speaking of. Well, John Kerry says, have no fear. The quartet, the Mideast, Middle East Quartet, they are coming very soon, and they are going to devise a plan to ease tensions. I would advise everyone to go back and read the temple brochure because there are talks of a wall being built, there's talks of tension being eased, and there's talks of agreements being made. 
But don't think that any of these things that are being said are being said just for words to be spoken. They're testing the waters to see what can be done. Well, there is a news journalist. Her name is Lucy Archery. She is from Israel. She is an Arab Israelite. So she is a Muslim who does news for the Israelis. Now, they interviewed her on CNN, and watch this woman's emotion. You can see raw emotion come from this woman, and she's saying that things are very different, different than they have been ever before. We've always had violence. Media has portrayed it to be a little bit different than what it actually was, but now things are very different. People are fearing. People are wondering, are they going to die? And listen to the comments she makes about leadership, how the leadership has kind of left them be. Now, that leadership, part of that leadership that is not bringing peace, of course, is that Mideast Peace Quartet, which is trying to bring peace, but yet they don't have the way to peace. Once again, Israel breaking down like never before. Then Assad this week, the leader of Syria, made a surprise visit to Moscow. He was in Moscow meeting with Vladimir Putin at the Kremlin, and both of them showing the unity they have together and standing together. This is very important, and there's more to this than just removing Assad from government. President Obama come out, along with NATO coming out, saying that Russia is doing the wrong thing, that they will not accomplish peace by what they're doing. Why is this so important? Why is Assad, or why is the land of Syria so important? Well, Saudi Arabia, they're actually facing, through their oil agreements that they've made, imagine this, Saudi Arabia, under current contracts, will be bankrupt by 2020. Now, imagine a country rich in oil being bankrupt by 2020. Well, they're under contracts, and their contracts have said that if they cannot meet demand, then countries can go to somewhere else to buy their oil. So Saudi Arabia has flooded the market to make sure they don't lose these contracts. Well, can you guess what country is standing by to take these contracts away? Russia. Russia is the second largest supplier of oil, and they're very ready to do so. Russia doesn't take the petrodollar. America can't have that. Watch these things very closely. The oil price meltdown, there's a little article on that. Then the CIA director recently had his email hacked by a high school student here in the United States. So keep that in mind, how... how Great is your password. How secretive is your accounts if the CIA director himself got his own email hacked? You know, think about that for a moment. And then citizens, please look through this. Don't get caught up in the stupidity that's being showed in some of this. Citizens in St. Louis, there was a lot of chemicals taken there from the Manhattan Project, which was back in the 30s, for nuclear weaponry, and it was stored in St. Louis. They're saying a lot of radiation has been detected in the soil and many people are now getting cancer. Cancer is growing at that vicinity greater than anywhere else. Now keep in mind when these people go to the hospital and they say you got cancer due to all this radiation, what are they going to give them? Radiation. Look at the stupidity behind this, okay? There's more to cancer than just chemicals. It's sin. It's sin. And, of course, they want to sue. The people here want to sue the company that did this, but they're long gone out of business. So they're left to suffer in what they have. And then last but not least, this is very interesting, and watch it. It's about this injustice system we have, the non-Supreme Court. But it's about a man, this was on 60 Minutes, it was about a man who was sentenced to death in Louisiana. He was sentenced to death for a crime that he did not commit. Now, of course, he was exonerated 30 years after he spent 30 years in a cell, five by seven, only getting out one hour a day in solitary confinement. This man spent his life, and whenever he was exonerated, of course, there was a district attorney who was very apologetic that did so, and he gives accounting on what he did that was wrong, but the new district attorney, watch his attitude. Look at the character. The the previous district attorney that prosecuted this man said there was no justice, no justice whatsoever in this, but the new district attorney claiming there's justice for everyone. And watch the comments that are made because there was no foundation, there's no justice, and the man openly admits no compassion in the system. If we could go ahead and play the news. Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled.
Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you news as it relates to Bible prophecy and as it is foretold by Yeshua Hawkins. Well, we have record-breaking weather events, several countries calling for Assad to step down, and Putin meeting with the president who seemingly everyone wants removed, that is Assad, radioactive waste and its effects, and a man finds freedom from prison a little too late, and the DA who feels justice was served, sentencing a man innocent of the crime committed. But we start off with Hurricane Patricia is due to make landfall very soon and it's being called a monstrous storm, a category five that has winds of over 235 miles per hour. It is the strongest hurricane ever recorded and is expected to make a catastrophic landfall along Mexico's Pacific coast. Well, resort cities like Manzanil and Puerto Vallara had residents and tourists scurrying for shelter from the storm. From space, the storm is enormous and is expected to bring with it torrential rains into Mexico and parts of Texas. Now, it literally exploded overnight from a tropical storm into a Category 4 hurricane due in part to the El Nino effect, the unusually warm waters feeding the storm. And we talked a little bit about that in several reports ago about how that El Nino system was much larger than it was previous. That's right. So emergency officials went through towns warning people to leave, and even a government official went on television warning of the power of the storm, saying it was strong enough to lift cars, destroy homes, and sweep people away. The Weather Channel's Brian Norcross said this hurricane is comparable to an EF4 tornado, but huge compared to the size of a normal tornado. And where this comes ashore, we're expected, we expect, he said, total devastation. Mm. Now, again, Patricia is the strongest storm ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. It's more than double the strength of Superstorm so Sandy, which landed in New York with winds of 80 miles per hour. Yeah, I remember the amount of rain that brought as well. Uh, Hurricane Katrina had winds of 135 miles per hour, and even Hurricane Andrew, a Category 5 hurricane, wasn't this big. It had winds of 165 miles per hour when it made landfall in Florida, and more than two dozen people lost their lives in that particular storm. Well, violence continues in the West Bank as two members of Hamas stabbed an Orthodox Jew in Bayit Kamesh, which is raising fears that the group might become more involved in the terror. Mm. Now, diplomatic efforts to end the bloodshed have been kicked into high gear with a meeting between John Kerry, Netanyahu, and Frederica Mogherini. Mogherini called for a Middle East Quartet meeting to coordinate efforts and to send a message to the parties to calm down the situation on the ground. Kerry stated, if parties want to try, and I believe they do, he said, want to try to move to a de-escalation, there are a set of choices that are available. Now, UNESCO has failed to call the Western Wall an integral part of the Alaska Mosque. Uh, a final draft resolution was changed and the clause was removed. But UNESCO has approved a resolution criticizing Israel for failing to protect heritage sites and rebuild regions destroyed by the war. The resolution also calls for Israel to stop taking provocative measures that protects the sanctity and integrity of the Alaska Mosque. The draft resolution was submitted by Egypt. Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates on behalf of the Palestinian Authority. Tel Aviv has condemned the resolution and called it an endeavor to distort history. Now, in an interview with CNN, an Arab-Israeli TV anchor, who is also a citizen of Israel, spoke about the communication breakdown in Israel and the atmosphere of fear that has developed as a result. Lucy Aharish said, when you're walking on the streets, you can feel the tension. You can feel that people are afraid. People are looking over their shoulders to see if somebody is coming to stab or kill them. Mm. Boy, certainly an uneasy feeling and nobody would want to, you know, experience. Yeah, that's right. A lot of uh, fear and distrust in the air. Uh, she continued, or to see if someone is going to yell Allah al Akbar and start randomly killing people. On the other side, you see... Jewish people killing Arab people only because they're Arabs. It seems that Arabs and Jews aren't able anymore to trust each other or listen to each other. 
People are talking, but no one is listening. When you speak of a war, it used to be of Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. But it's not a war of Israelis and Palestinians anymore. It's a war of religion. Hmm. She said, war of religion. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, she also said, although we, the Israelis and Palestinians, are living on the same land, the lack of diplomacy and a peace initiative is creating a vacuum. And when you have a vacuum, you have terror and are giving a stage to extremists from both sides. And when you don't have leaders that are giving you something to control, uh, who don't have a path or direction... When you don't have a mother and a father that is telling you, hey, stop doing it because I said so. It seems like we're starting to act like children, like terrorist children doing whatever we want and whenever we want because nobody is telling us not to. So it looks like her statement is that we're lacking the moral guidance that we need so that we can make better decisions. Absolutely. She said she used to tell people that what you see on the news isn't true. We don't go around stabbing each other, but now we are. We are killing each other. We've lost control, and it seems like the United States isn't doing anything about it. Now, she concluded, maybe the United States has given up on us, and maybe our leaders, speaking of the Arabs and Jewish alike, Mm -hmm. have also given up on us. Sad state. Well, in other news, the quartet said recently, significant steps must be taken to reach a two-state solution. Frederica, Frederica, excuse me, Mogherini, the EU foreign policy chief, said the quartet condemns all acts of terror and violence towards civilians and reiterates its call for maximum restraint of provocative and rhetoric action. Quartet envoys plan to visit the region soon in an effort to engage both sides to try to restore confidence and to move towards a two-state solution. Now, Russia's foreign minister has met with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry in Vienna about a peaceful solution to the Syrian crisis and to discuss whether other countries in the region, as well as major international powers, should get involved. U.S. State Department spokesman John Kirby addressed reporters recently speaking of a meeting with Russia's Lavrov, saying that it was for the purpose of getting at a political transition in Syria. Well, the U.S., Turkey, and Saudi Arabia want Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to step down. But Russia has been stepping up the military support for the Assad administration. Vladimir Putin met with Assad recently in Moscow and spoke on the phone the following day to the leaders of both countries of Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Observers say Putin is trying to take the initiative on Syria, showing support for Assad while also willing to talk with countries backing the Syrian opposition. Well, for more on the meeting between Presidents Assad and Putin, we shift over now to our correspondent, Larry McGee. Larry, was President Bashar al-Assad's meeting with uh, Putin a scheduled event, or are the reports of it being somewhat a surprise really true? What's the latest on that there, Larry? The reports are still that the meeting was unannounced, but President Putin and his welcoming council showed no signs of being put off about it. The two leaders are reported to have discussed their current battle against terrorism, as well as the air assaults being carried out by Moscow on the Syrian government's behalf. In televised comments, President Putin stated that the Syrian people practically by themselves have been fending off and fighting against international terrorism for several years now. He went on to say that Syria has been experiencing serious losses, but lately it has been achieving serious positive results. President Assad then contributed his thanks to the Russian leader, expressing appreciation on behalf of the Syrian people for Moscow standing up for the ancient nation and its independence. He went on to say that if not for the intervention of Russia, terrorism in the region would have spread even further to an even greater amount of countries. The grouping of countries which collectively make up the North Atlantic Treaty Organization are not as appreciative of Moscow's efforts, however, with NATO Deputy Secretary General Alexander Vershbo stating that since Russia's objectives in the region differ from that of the U.S. and its Confederates, its air raids run the risk of creating an incident which could get out of hand. 
America and its cronies are said to be upset that Moscow has targeted the insurgents seeking to overthrow the Syrian government and have responded by pushing the pawn of Turkey, leveling claims that the Kremlin's actions have violated Turkish airspace. Washington has lent its voice directly to the conflict, with the president stating this week that where the Orthodox nation is concerned, there is no meeting of the minds in terms of strategy, but his hope is that as Russia starts to realize that they are not going to be able to bomb their way into a peaceful situation inside Syria, that America will then be able to make progress on that front. The reported effectiveness of Moscow's precision strikes, however, is said to be producing skepticism with respect to the sincerity of American efforts, since it has also been bombing inside Syria itself for quite some time now. Persia, one of Syria's few allies in the region, has also come forward to denounce the approach of Saudi Arabia towards other countries in and around the Great River Euphrates as being destructive. Persia's foreign ministry spokesperson delivered the remarks after the Saudi foreign minister threatened to confront Tehran if it fails to give up its continued aggression on the kingdom. Iran responded by calling the comments indecent and undiplomatic and noted that such an approach has plagued some countries such as Yemen and Syria with war and extremism. The precious commodity of oil, which is synonymous with the nations of the Tigris and Euphrates region, is believed to be headed towards a plunge from which it will not soon return. The banksters of Goldman Sachs are reporting that crude will dip to $20 a barrel, which represents a fall of 50% from recent prices. The global oil surplus, slowing demand, and a lack of stored space are being labeled as potential causes, but OPEC is apparently completely disinterested in cutting production. As a counter move, U.S. experts are suggesting a decrease in oil production among non-OPEC nations in an effort to offset the excess and rebalance the market. Amid the competition, U.S. oil has dropped by 2 percent, the latest low in the ups and downs of the petro wars. War online is also a concern as hackers reportedly stole into the personal email of the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Private and potentially sensitive information was allegedly posted to the net by a high schooler who says that he hacked into Director Brenner's personal email account by tricking AOL and Verizon to disclose enough information to reset his password. The hacker reportedly posted a list of names and emails of present and former intelligence personnel, but apparently had enough decency to blank out their social security numbers. The incident is being labeled as an embarrassment and an alarming indication that there is nothing secure about email. The perils of the present day are not just limited to the technology stemming from the increase in knowledge, however. Here in the States, the Centers for Disease Control has launched an investigation to determine the source of an increase in what are said to be several very rare forms of cancer. Curiosity Spotlight is on a county just outside of St. Louis this week, which includes a stream called Coldwater Creek. For two decades, two sites have been maintained along the creek to store radioactive waste from America's nuclear weapons program. The waste is said to be produced by Malincrot in St. Louis, which was hired by the government to process uranium. Tens of thousands of barrels of nuclear waste were produced by the chemical company and are stored along the stream, some of them wide open and exposed to the elements. The sites are now believed to have contaminated the waters of Coldwater Creek and its surrounding soil and served as a catalyst for cancer in many of its residents. For YPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Katan Jeff, back to you. Well, both uh, Assad and Putin, definitely key players in the situation over there in the Middle East. That's right. We'll see how that turns out. Well, imagine what it would be like spending almost half of your life on death row for a crime you didn't even commit. 
Well, this is exactly what took place in the case of Glenn Ford from Shreveport, Louisiana. At age 65, he was exonerated for a murder or the murder of a local jeweler, Isidore Rosman, when the real murderer admitted to the crime. Well, Mr. Rosman, the jeweler had been robbed before his death, and Ford, who had done yard work for Rosman, had admitted to pawning some of the stolen jewelry. Well, even though the case against Glenn Ford was weak, with no physical evidence linking him to the crime itself, the odds were against him. His court-appointed lawyers had never practiced criminal law, and the district attorney at the time, Marty Stroud, was determined to get a conviction to boost his career regardless of any possibility of the man's innocence. Stroud got a quick conviction putting together an all-white jury who reached a decision within three hours of deliberation. Ford was sentenced to death row at Angola, Louisiana's maximum security prison. Also referred to as the Alcatraz of the South, Angola is known for its harsh penalties and even harsher conditions. Wow. Well, after spending most of his, his life in a five by seven cell, nearly 30 years later, Glenn Ford was released. However, at age 65, he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and he was told he only had a few months to live. He has been denied any compensation for his wrongful imprisonment with the exception of a $20 gift card Ford was given upon release. So I don't know how far he would actually get with something like that. In a recent interview by 60 Minutes, Dale Cox, the district attorney who helped get Ford exonerated, was asked if there could be any compassion given to Mr. Ford for having been on death row for so many years unfairly. He said, I'm not in the compassion business. None of us as prosecutors or defense lawyers are in the compassion business. Hmm. We're in the legal business, he continued. Uh, so to suggest that somehow what happened to Glenn Ford is abhorrent, Yes, it's unfair, but it's not illegal, and it's not even immoral. It just doesn't fit your perception of fairness, he continued. Well, Ford is one of 156 death row inmates who have been exonerated since 1973. Uh, he did die in hospice, Mr. Ford did, due to his illness in June uh, of this year. And to get the entire story on Glenn Ford's case, you can go to CBS 60 Minutes and watch 30 years on death row. Well, I agree with Mr. Dale Cox. The legal system today is not in the compassion business. With over 2.2 million prisoners incarcerated in the United States and a recidivism rate of 57%, it's plain to see that our justice system in general needs a change. Ever ask yourself why our societies seem to sink lower and lower in morality while crime, diseases, disrespect, and the I don't care attitude continues to increase? What has mankind rejected, pushed aside, disregarded that has brought us to this point we're at today? Well, if you find the answer to that question, you'll find the, the answer to all your questions. Yisra Hawkins, overseer of the House of Yahweh, is the only individual that has the knowledge to pull mankind out of this pit of immorality that is plaguing our societies today. Well, contact the House of Yahweh today and request your free copy of the Prophetic Word magazine and monthly newsletter. Find the answer to the question we ask, what has mankind rejected? Then go to ypnnews.com, click on the Contact Us tab, and send us your answer. We look forward to hearing from you. To contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at the House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas, 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494 or visit them on any of their websites at www.yahweh.com, www.yeshrohawkins.com, or www.yahwehsbranch.com. You can also check out our new website, www ypnnews.com and to email the house of Yahweh send your emails to info at Yahweh.com and for any calls outside the United States please call the number on your screen well don't go anywhere up next is another enlightening message from Yeshua Hawkins from all of us here at YPN News I'm Jeffrey Heimerman and I'm Katan Alexander thanks for watching
You may all be seated. Now, there was a few points we want to stress out that you take note of. I'm sure everyone could see the unfairness that was shown in this trial. And, of course, this is not a trial that we're immune to. This takes place every day in the system that has been created in our world today. Of course, this system that starts on the seven hills with an agency and a spokesman that takes these messages from place to place, letting people know what they should do. Well, of course, he said, you notice compassion. He's not in the compassion business. Well, it's better said that only the house of Yahweh is in the compassion business where we actually have empathy. Now, it's very important that we take note of that because I hope everyone was appalled that this man noticed. Did you see when he left prison compared to what he looked like in the interview? That was only a matter of a month or two. Now, he's already dead. He died from cancer. And it was almost like that without saying it, they wanted to get this man out so they didn't have to pay for his cancer treatments is more what it was. Get him out, let him be fended for himself, put him in a halfway house, get him out of our hair. We won't give any money to him whatsoever. Now, that's the lack of compassion that is shown. Well, we ourselves... Remember Lucy Otterish, the lady that was speaking about how Israel is changing, how it's becoming very violent? It's not just a media propaganda campaign anymore. It's getting this bad. We've lost faith in our leaders. Our leaders seem to have no desire or care for us. Well, that's what we're training for. Take that DA that was showing repentance. He's wanting to apologize for what he did 30 years later, but there's repentance there. Imagine with this DA that just spoke about how he's not a person of compassion when he finds out what that system has taught him and how wrong that system is. And then remember, what is our goal? Why were we called to the house of Yahweh in these last days? What is our goal to come to Yahweh's house? Is it not to learn to be teachers of righteousness, to be able to show compassion, to judge and have justice shown, true justice, not taking from someone, not doing it for gain, but actually showing justice so everyone is taken care of? Well, what we see is a world that is crying out for justice. It's crying out for teachers. You can easily see how two billion people are soon going to be crying out. They're already crying out, asking someone come lead us. When that lady mentioned that they need a mother and a father, they do need Yahweh and the house of Yahweh. That is our mother and father. So keep that in mind when this world is calling out. If we don't take hold of what we've been given and we don't seek to increase what we've been given, we're no better than the DA that's sitting there saying, you want fairness? I'm not in the compassion business. No, he's in the bribery business. We've known that for years in the house of Yahweh. But these are the things we have to take sincere. And then write this down for your notes. Write this down because you're going to see this come up in the news a lot. It came up this week. When you hear the word quartet, well, of course, we, we, we're very familiar with the Middle East quartet of Russia, the United States, the UN, and also the European Union. Well, there is a new quartet, and it is called the Syrian Quartet. Now, they're trying to, what they say, bring peace to Syria. And that consists of Russia, the United States, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Now, why are those two so important? Well, Saudi Arabia has a lot to play in the selling of its oil. If you know anything about business diversity, Saudi Arabia never diversified. They've always made their money off of one product, and that's all they've ever done. You shut off that one product, you shut down that country. Well, remember they're bombing Yemen. Remember what's taking place with Yemen and the very small port that they have to work through. Saudi Arabia has to get their oil through where Yemen comes close to connecting to the Horn of Africa. They have to get that oil through. Well, Iran, remember, Iran is supporting Yemen. They're trying to get supplies in. And if Iran wants to move into Yemen and help shut that port down, it won't matter how much oil Saudi Arabia pumps. They're not going to get it out there. But they could get their oil out if the governing system was to change in Syria and they ran a pipeline up through Europe. They could sell a lot of oil that way and no one can mess with it. So watch what's going on taking place. Why is Turkey so important? 
Turkey controls the water of the Euphrates River. It even showed Russia this week bombing bridges that cross the Euphrates River from Turkey into Syria and around those areas. You shut the water off, oil means absolutely nothing. You can live without oil, you can't live without water. So watch very closely all of these things taking place. And then the Temple Mount. We have the Temple Mount. Everyone make sure, because there was a lot of question, and I had this question one time until a great Kahan showed me. I kind of just assumed I thought I knew what it was. But we always think about this right here, the Dome of the Rock, and we think about problems taking place there and all these battles we've seen. But really what we're talking about is the al Aska Mosque. That is the mosque where the Jews go in, and they've been going in and praying, but the rules were they could visit, not pray. You have the Western Wall right here. That is where they pray. And this is what Palestine was asking UNESCO to create as one. The Alaska Mosque and the Western Wall, and that would prohibit all of the Jews from coming and praying. But once again, that was pulled off the table, but it was put there for a reason. They're testing the waters to see what people think. You know, there was very few countries that voted against that total resolution, being the UK, the United States, and other allies to Israel. So remember, this is the Alaska Mosque. This, of course, is the Dome of the Rock. I would encourage everyone, by next week, get this, read it. If you, I'll give you a couple places you can get it. If you need one, if you do not have, it's a peaceful solution to building the next temple in Jerusalem. This was first put out in 1989. Of course, this is the work of Pastor and the team that he took with him. A lot of work, a lot of time went into this. The peaceful solution, that's where this came from, a peaceful solution for everyone. Now, of course, this temple isn't going to bring peace. Uh, This house is going to bring peace here in Abilene, Texas. It's important to remember that. But this is this false peace that they're looking for. Now, this temple, uh, make sure, go through and read it. If you need a copy of it, there's a few ways you can get a copy. You can go on to Yahweh.com. And you can download the PDF or you can read the PDF. That's for everyone overseas and anyone who doesn't have one. Now, you can also, if you don't have a copy, you can go to the South Office to request one or you can go to the office on uh, TMP Lane to request one. But make sure, put forth an effort to start reading this brochure. You're going to need this information. It's very vital to all the prophecies that are taking place to hurt not the oil and the wine Why are the merchants going to say there's no one left to buy our merchandise? Remember what Pastor said, if there's certain things you want in your food storage, you might want to start getting it there. And remember what our goal for coming to Yahweh's house was. Remember that first love we had Well, we were called to be teachers. Genetically, go back and read page four of the character unit. Genetically, we're all made up to be teachers. Whether we think we are or not, it's in us to be a teacher. We have to develop that. We have to shape that. We have to mold that. And we use the teacher that teaches us to do those things. That's how we're molded into that, that teacher of righteousness. So please, by next Sabbath, get that brochure, go over it, get all these things in your mind and be prepared to uh, increase a lot in knowledge with the golden oil that will come forth. At this time, if everyone will please stand.